case you missed the announcement video for this, there's a link in this video's description if you're interested. I'll give you a brief rundown of what this project is. So the first batch of Frame 1 heavies had quite a few leftover and B-stock chassis. I imagine they probably wanted to sell these as completed units, but the STM32 microcontroller that the Frame 1 uses has been out of stock for a very long time, so that was probably not feasible. What they're doing instead is selling these chassis separately, and publishing an open source circuit board that you can use with it, which is super cool for DIY people like me. The guy behind the Frame 1 project asked if I'd be interested in receiving a set of parts to start working on a build guide before the release, as well as to try out this new PCB. I love making DIY guides and trying out new hardware, and this will be the first time I get to experiment with a Raspberry Pi Pico. I think this is a really cool project, so I was super happy to agree to that. So, here's a video guide on how to assemble an open Frame 1. One more thing before we start the guide, I'm actually going to be giving away this controller, so stay tuned to the end of the video for more details on that. Alright, let's get into this build. So the open frame 1 comes with the main chassis, a switch plate, which is pre-installed, and a bottom panel, which is also pre-installed. What you will need to provide is the blank PCB itself, this USB-C port, a shot key diode, you can either use a surface mount one like an MBR120, or a through-hole one like a 1N5817, some 2.54mm pin headers, a Raspberry Pi Pico, a micro USB cable, Optionally, a specific kind of USB-A port, and also optionally, KLH hot swap sockets. On this pre-release version of the board, this USB-A port is actually not going to be compatible with the chassis, as it will take up too much height here. The final release of the board is probably going to have a mid-board mounted USB port, and that will allow it to actually fit within the confines of the case. So I'm actually not going to be using this, but in theory, the release board will support a USB-A port. I'll get to how we can get around using this later. And as far as the KLH sockets go, you can use these if you want to make your controller hot swappable, but if you don't mind, you can just solder your switches straight to the board. It has mounts for both soldered switches and for the hot swap sockets. Finally, you'll need 20 switches. I'm going to use Novelty's Silk Red, and you'll need 20 keycaps. I'm going to use Frame 1 PBT black caps. You could also 3D print your keycaps. I 3D printed these on my FDM printer out of PLA, and they turned out pretty good. And you can also order keycaps from JLC PCB in this nylon material, and these are very nice. They're almost as nice as the official Frame 1 caps, which you can see on the right here. They're both really, really good, but I would say that the Frame 1 caps are a bit nicer. As far as tools goes, you'll need a soldering iron of some sort. I use this Hacko FX888D. I highly recommend it. But there are some cheaper options out there if you are interested in spending a bit less. There's one called the T12 that some people in my Discord server recommend. There's the 939D+, which I've seen a lot of people online recommend, and it looks a lot like a clone of this Hacko, and I think it can even use the Hacko tips, which are really good. I know some people have recommended the Pinesol, which is a really cheap option, and I've also heard recommendations for the TS100 and the TS80 online. You'll need some solder. I use Kester 6337 Rosencore. There are some cheap no-name solders online that have similar specs, and I imagine that they're probably pretty good too. Kester solder is pretty expensive, especially if you're buying it in bulk, so don't be afraid to shop around. Beware of cheap no-name lead-free solders that come with super cheap soldering irons. Cheap irons already suck really bad, and their tips die super fast, but using bad solder is just going to make things worse. You're also going to want some flush cutters. These are used for snipping pin headers and the 1N5817 diode if you use that. And you're going to need a Phillips 1 screwdriver. If you want to solder the USB-C port yourself instead of having someone like JLC assemble it, I would highly recommend getting some flux. I use Chipquick SMD291. This stuff is really great for that. You're also going to want a hot air gun to do the surface mount hidden pins. I use this 858D. It's a really cheap hot air gun, but it does the trick for these ports. This particular board, JLC assembled the USB-C port and the shot key diode, and the open source repository will have instructions for how to have JLC assemble these parts if you don't want to do them yourself. If you're interested in seeing an instructional video on how to solder a USB-C port, let me know and I can make a video on that. So before we get into doing any soldering, we're going to actually want to install the firmware onto our Pico. You want to do this at the very beginning just to confirm that it's in working order before you solder it to the board. If you have a GameCube to USB adapter plugged into your computer right now, go ahead and unplug it. I'll come back to why in just a second. To install the firmware onto the Pico, you're first going to want to go to the releases page on the Pico Rectangle GitHub repository and download the latest UF2 file. Once you've done that, plug your Pico into the computer while holding this boot select button. 
You'll see that the Pito shows up as a flash drive on the computer, and all you have to do to flash the firmware is drag and drop the UF2 file onto the Pito. The drive will disappear and the Pito will now be programmed. When you're plugged into the PC via USB, the Pito is going to act as a GameCube controller to USB adapter. You can confirm that this is working as intended by opening Dolphin, setting the controller to GameCube adapter mode, and confirming that you see adapter detected. This is the reason why you want to unplug your GCC adapter earlier, since you can only have one connected to a PC at a time. Right, so once you have that out of the way, you can go ahead and unplug your Pico and start assembling your circuit board. So the first thing I'm going to assemble is the Pico. I think the easiest way to do this is to prop up the circuit board on something. And then you can put your pin headers into the board. And since it's propped up, the pin headers will go all the way through and rest in their final locations. With the pin headers in place, you can drop the Pico onto them and start soldering. I personally like to hold the Pico down in the middle while doing the first few solder joints just to make sure everything is nice and lined up. At first, I do the four corners just to make sure everything is flush. And I will examine it on the side to make sure that bank of pin headers is looking good, which it is. Then I'll do the other side's corners. And we can check those. All right, so now that everything is confirmed to be flush, you can freely solder the rest of them. All right, so now that we got the pin header soldered up to the Pico, what I like to do is pre-tin one of the four corners on the board like so. And then I'm going to put the Pico into the other three corners. And you'll see that it is not able to go into that hole because we just filled it with solder. And if we flip the board over and then heat that one hole, It'll allow the Pico to snap into place. And now we know that the Pico is flushly secured to the board. We can now do the opposite corner. So I'm going to solder the opposite corner. And similar to how we did with the top of the Pico, we're going to make sure that these pin headers are flush to the board. And right now we can see that there's a little bit of a gap. So what we can do to fix that is push down on the Pico and then heat that solder pad in each corner from below. And we'll see that it starts to push down to the board. And same with this back corner over here. I'm going to heat it up from the bottom and push from above. So with those two corners done and the Pico nice and flush to the board, we're going to do the other two corners. And make sure that those corners are flush. And it looks like they are. So with the corners done, I'll do just one more in the middle. And then I'm going to use my flush cutters to snip down these excess pins because they are sticking up too high. I recommend putting your and above the pin and sort of twisting as you do it to try and prevent the pins from flying everywhere. All right, so now that we have all these pins snipped down, we can solder up the rest of them. All right, so we've got all of these pins soldered up. 
In order to reroute the USB lines from the Pico into the USB-C port, we're going to need to use a micro USB cable to connect the Pico to the main board. As mentioned, this current design, this USB-A port is not able to work because this port is just too thick to fit in between this and the switch plate. The final board is going to attempt to have a mid-mounted port, because in theory that would allow for an adequate amount of space. If that doesn't work out, or if you don't want to buy a USB port, you can just take a cable, cut it in half, and then solder the wires up to these four pins right here. And that's what I'm going to be doing here. So you can do that by cutting off the USB-A end of the cable. And there's going to be four wires in this cable that you'll need to expose. You can use some wire strippers to get this shielding off like so, and that exposes the four wires. And then use a smaller gauge wire stripper to strip the individual wires. So now that we got our four wires exposed, I'm going to go ahead and tin these wires. So usually in a USB cable, you're going to have a red, white, green, and black wire. The red wire is your 5 volts, black is ground, white is USB data minus, and green is USB data plus. You can see those four labels here on the board, and that is where we're going to be soldering stuff up to. So once I have these wires tinned, I like to slot them into their respective holes on the board. With the wires slotted in from above, I like to prop up the board once again and solder these wires from beneath the board. So with those four wires soldered into place, we can test the USB-C port on our board by plugging the Pico in, and then connecting the USB-C port up to a computer. Once you confirm that the USB port's working on computers, if you have a USB-C to GameCube cable, you can go ahead and test it on console right now. All right, so now that I've confirmed that this works on console and PC, I'm going to go ahead and solder up the KLH hot swap sockets. These are pretty easy to solder, but they do take a little bit of time. First thing I like to do is just slot them into their respective places. They have these little plastic pegs that will go into the board, and they'll sort of rest in the place that they need to be. All right, so now that we have all those in place, I'll show you really quick how to solder up one of these. So to solder up one of these sockets, I like to First, just heat up the pad and feed some solder into one of them. And then I'll press down on the socket and heat the joint once more. And that will sort of press it to be flush with the board. Let that cool down. And then I'll solder the other side. You want to make sure that you use uh, quite a bit of solder here, otherwise you'll run the risk of the socket breaking the pad off of the board when you remove and insert switches. I had that happen on one of my keyboards before and that was no fun. But if you use a good amount of solder, then you shouldn't run into that problem. So that's really all it takes to solder up one of these, so I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of them. All right, so we got all 20 of these soldered. I recommend looking at all of them and making sure they're all flat with the board. And that is the entirety of the circuit board finished. So to assemble this thing, we just need to take the bottom panel off using a number one Phillips driver. Now we just need to bend this table down in a way where it'll be flush with the board and sort of stow away the cable in this little cutout here, or wherever you can find a place for it to fit. Drop the board into place, and I'm going to tuck the cable like so. Then you'll take your PCB screws. There are five of these. Then we will put the bottom panel back on. I'm going to just do a couple of screws first while we test it. 
And then if everything is working, I'll go ahead and do the rest of the screws. And when you go to insert a switch, be sure that these two pins are nice and straight. Otherwise, you will have the pins bend as they insert into the socket, and then the switch will not work. So make sure those are nice and straight, and you can go ahead and just press them in. Once again, if you are doing your soldered switches, then you can press them in with the pins facing up, and then you'll have to go around and then solder through the bottom. Uh, if you're using the hot swap sockets, the pins will face down. For example, you can see that this switch has a bent pin. You can just simply unbend that pin back into being level with the other one. So, and then it should work. So with all the switches in, I like to test them all before I do any keycaps because removing the keycaps is a little bit tricky. Okay, so I just tested this and it looks like this switch and these three are not working. So to fix that, I'm going to remove them. And you can see on this here switch, that this pin right here got a bit bent. And what I like to do to fix that is to take some small pliers and try and grab the part that got bent and then straighten it all out. The switch now has good looking pins again. So we'll try that again. And after straightening the pin out, it looks like our switch is working again. So that's cool. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for the other three. Okay, so after a couple tries of straightening those pins out, all these buttons are now working. Okay, so now I've confirmed that all of the buttons are working. I'm going to go ahead and put all the keycaps on. All right, so now we've got all the caps on. Go ahead and put the bottom panel on and we'll be done with this thing. All right, so now I got this thing tested on GameCube and PC and all of the buttons work. This thing's good to go. There's a lot of really interesting features built into the Pico Rectangle firmware, like remapping at runtime and native USB support for Switch. If enough people are interested, I could make a guide regarding how to use the firmware and all of its different modes. But I'm going to wrap up this video here. The README on the firmware repository goes over all of the features and how to use them in great depth. So if you're interested in learning more about using the controller once it's finished, go check that out. Hopefully this video helped you in building your own OpenFrame 1. I think it's a really great project for people who are new to soldering, as none of the solder joints are particularly difficult if you get that USB-C port assembled for you. If you're more advanced at soldering, you can just order blank boards and assemble the USB-C port yourself. It's not too bad either. If you have any questions about the build, be sure to ask in the comments below or to join my Discord server, which is linked in the description. Either myself or any of the awesome people in there will be happy to help you. If these kinds of videos are interesting to you, be sure to subscribe to this channel as I have a lot more cool stuff in the works. Take care, everyone.